So if you have your Bibles with you, I didn't give any of the scriptural references today, so they won't be on the wall, I don't think. So Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19. sinners. People look at this tax collector, what's Jesus doing with that sinner? 
That's a spirit of Phariseeism. That's a religious spirit that thinks that way and says those kinds of things. Because Jesus came for the sinner. And we as Christians spend all our time sometimes with Christians. And we need to do that. We need to fellowship. We need to come together and encourage one another. But we also need to spur one another on to good works. That means we need to get out into the world. As somebody said, salt doesn't do any good in the salt shaker. We've got to get the salt out there into the community, into our environment, amongst the people, the sinners, wherever they might be. And I know that God will anoint us and use us in a powerful and mighty way. Most people don't get saved through a preacher expanding on some obscure passage of Scripture. Most people get saved simply through a testimony or the preaching of what we call the old-fashioned gospel, the cross of Jesus Christ. There's a reason that evangelist Billy Graham was so successful is because he stuck to the simple gospel message. And he had influence with leaders all over the world. He wasn't a perfect man. There is no perfect man. But we're here to preach about a perfect man. Amen. We're here to lift up someone that was perfect, Jesus Christ. He was a man and he is a man and he lived amongst us. <clears throat> and he was perfect. He was without sin. And so we point people to Jesus. And when Jesus is lifted up, he draws people to himself. And so this morning we ask the question, why did Jesus come to earth? Well, there are different reasons he came. The Bible gives us different reasons. I just read one of them. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. But Jesus, even above and beyond that, was motivated by the glory of his heavenly Father. Jesus came to do the Father's will. Now, the Father's will was for him to come and die on the cross and save us. But that's what motivated Jesus as much as anything else. His obedience to his heavenly Father. To bring glory to his heavenly Father. In John chapter 3 and 34, Jesus said to the one whom God has sent, speaks the words of God, and to him God gives the Spirit without them. Jesus came to speak the words of his heavenly Father. He didn't come to do his own thing. He didn't come with his own message. He only said what he heard his Heavenly Father say. He only did what his Heavenly Father told him to do. How many know that is the secret to successful ministry for each one of us today? If we will simply spend time in the presence of our God and only do what he tells us to do. Say what he tells us to say. You can read all kinds of books on leadership and all kinds of principles. Uh, and, and they can be helpful, but the bottom line is simply this. Do what God tells you to do. Yeah. Even Mary, Jesus' mother on earth, said to those at the wedding, Kenneth, just do what he tells you to do. Just do what my son's telling you to do. Just do what he's telling you to do. Just leave the results to God. Just do what he tells you to do. It's amazing how many people have a vision and a burden on the heart to go out and do things and they want you to jump on board with them. Well, sometimes you've got to do what you're called to do and don't worry about what other people are doing. Whether they join you or don't join you, it doesn't matter. You do what God's telling you to do. Jesus came to do the will of His Father. And that was always the bottom line. When He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying, in tremendous anguish, knowing that he was about to go to the cross and to bear the sins of the entire world, he said, Father, if it's possible, may this cup pass from me, this cup of sorrow, may it pass. Prayed it three times, but he said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. In John chapter 20, if you want to turn there, read a couple of verses. John chapter 20. And verse 21.
And this is Jesus appearing to his disciples after his resurrection. And he says in verse 21, he says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus identified himself with his heavenly Father. He told the disciples by whose authority he did his work. Jesus didn't come to do his own thing. He came to fulfill the will of his heavenly Father. And then he said, as the Father has sent me, so now I send you. We've been sent by Jesus. We have been authorized by Jesus. We've been anointed by Jesus to go and to do the things that he did. In John chapter 17, um, we have the high priestly prayer. And let me just read the first five verses to you. And this is Jesus praying to his heavenly Father. He says, Father, the time has come Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have brought you glory by completing, fulfilling what you call me to this earth to do. A lot of people start out well, we don't finish well. If we want to bring glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we've got to finish what he calls us to do. Jesus said, I fulfill your will, Father. And as a result, I brought you glory here on earth. Complete what you called me to do. Jesus has now authorized us, his followers, to do the will of his Father. Remember in your divine calling, which is to spread the gospel message, your authority comes from God. That should give you great courage today. Your authority comes from God. God's called you to preach the gospel. God's called you to share your testimony. God's called you to share the word of God and to tell people about Jesus Christ. And God has authorized you to do it. Jesus is our example. We simply do what he did. As the Father sent Jesus, he now sends us. He then breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. It was by the power of the Holy Spirit that his followers could do the works of God. There is life in the breath of God. Man was created but did not come alive until God breathed into him the breath of life. That's what makes us different than the rest of the creatures on this planet. God created all the animals, all the fish, and all the birds, but only when he created man did he breathe into them the breath of life. We are created in the image and the likeness of God. We bear the image of God. And then Jesus breathed into his disciples and gave them the life of the Spirit. Amen. Breathe on me, Lord Jesus. Breathe on me. Jesus told the disciples when he was on earth, they were helpless as far as kingdom work was concerned. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's very humble, especially for proud people. People that are very independent. I don't need anyone's help. I can do it myself. Jesus says otherwise. Apart from me, you can do nothing. 
And now that Jesus is at the right hand of his Father in heaven, we are helpless apart from the Holy Spirit. We can do nothing in regards to accomplishing the will of God. A few weeks ago on Pentecost Sunday, I said that the early disciples were told to wait in Jerusalem until they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. To wait in Jerusalem until you were endued with power from on high. In Matthew 28, Jesus earlier had said, I am commissioning you to go into all the world and to make disciples of all nations. So he gave them their marching orders. He said, this is what you are to do. You're to go and make disciples. You're to go and preach the gospel. You're to lay hands on the sick and they will get well. You're to set people free from demon spirits. You're to teach them everything I taught you. This is what you're to do. But then he said, but wait in Jerusalem. Because you're not yet ready. You need to be endued with power from on high. We can do nothing apart from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit if we are going to be His witnesses, effective witnesses. Amen. It's not by eloquence. Paul said it himself. He said, I don't come to you with eloquence of spirit words. I come with a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that's available to all of us here today. You don't have to be a Jimmy Swaggart or a Billy Graham or a Reinhard Bonnke or or someone else that you might admire as a great preacher or teacher, all you have to be is a believer filled with the Holy Spirit, and you are anointed to do the works of God. <laughs> so wait, Jesus said, until you're about. But that's not enough. You need to wait to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, but Paul also taught that we need to also be prepared, not only have power, but we have to have knowledge. We have to have knowledge. Knowledge is power. We need to have knowledge of the gospel. It's amazing how many Christians today don't know the Word of God. They don't know the fundamental doctrines of Scripture. There's a lot of BS in our world today. Amen. And I'm not saying what you think I'm saying. I'm talking about biblical stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> we need to know why we believe what we believe. And it's not good enough to go up there and say, I believe this because the preacher said it. I believe it because a Sunday school teacher taught me this. You need to know why you believe it. Paul said we must be prepared to give an answer. A rational answer. An intelligent answer for the hope that lies within us. Jude said we are to contend for the faith once we're all delivered to the saints. Paul said if anyone comes with a different gospel, let him be anathema. Let him be eternally condemned. If they come with a different gospel that we've already delivered to you. I know we're supposed to be tolerant as Christians, but sometimes we're too tolerant. We should never be tolerant when it comes to deception. When it comes to lies. When it comes to ignorance. Because you shall know the truth. And the truth will set you free. And I believe what people in this world today want more than anything else is truth. Amen. We've heard enough about fake news that we're sick of hearing that term. But there is a lot of fake news out there. There's a lot of bias out there. We need the truth. And we need to deliver the truth. But we need to do it with gentleness, with kindness, and with love. Amen. Not as know-it-alls. We're not there to beat people over the head. We're there to just share why we have the hope we have. And then it becomes their choice whether they want to believe it and receive it or not. As leaders, pastors, teachers, but all of us as believers, 
need to study God's Word so that we can correctly handle the Word of Truth. Rightly divide the Word of Truth to cut it straight. We need to know why we believe what we believe. I, I know it's not popular today to have absolutes, but we have no choice as Christians mm -hmm. because the Bible gives us absolutes. Yeah. There's only one God. That's an absolute truth. There's not two gods. There's not a God with three heads. There's only one God. But the scripture teaches us that he is also God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God revealed to us in three persons. Not three beings, that wouldn't make any logical sense. One being revealed to us in three persons. Jesus does not put on the Father hat and then take it off when he wants to be the Son. And then if he's going to be the Holy Spirit, then he's the Holy Spirit. No. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, and there's God the Holy Spirit. And yet there's one God. We are a trichotomy. Body, soul, and spirit. We are created in the image of God. <clears throat> and this morning I don't have time to, uh, to go over all the doctrines of scripture and the fundamentals, but I want to talk specifically today <clears throat> before I close about salvation. The gospel of salvation. How many have ever heard of the Roman Romans Road? Very simple. Very simple presentation of the gospel. And I thought I would share some of that with you this morning. God's plan for human salvation is communicated throughout the entirety of Scripture. This book is a book of redemption from Genesis to Revelation. So a lot of stories in there and a lot of teaching, but really it's a book of redemption. It tells us about the fall of man, it tells us about the condition of man's heart, and then it tells us about how God has made a plan to save humanity. And so from Genesis to Revelation, you see salvation. But what is called the Romans' road to salvation is simply a collection of verses from the letter to the Romans. And these verses concisely explain God's salvation plan, including why man needs saving. That's, a, that's another problem there, where a lot of people don't think they need saving. They think Christians are weak. They don't realize that we know we're weak. That's why we come to Jesus. If Jesus is my crutch, somebody said, then give me two of them. That's why it's so hard for many people to be saved because of pride. They just will not humble themselves and know I need help. I need salvation. I need Savior. The human problem, number one, essentially, is man's separation from God due to sin. That's the problem. It's, it's not racism, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not drunkenness, it's not adultery. Those are all symptoms. The real problem is the heart of man, the separation from God. And it manifests in all these kinds of Sin. Romans 3 and 10 says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. For all have sinned, Romans 3, 23, and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. He's talking about, when he says there is no one righteous, no one, he's talking about those before you're saved. When you are saved, you are righteous. Jesus became sin that we might become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. But before we got saved, we were not righteous. No one's 
righteous. Everybody needs saved. All of us have fallen from the glory of God. But once you give your life to Jesus, and I understand the term, I'm, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, but sometimes we say that, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, and it makes it feel like I'm just a worm, not really worthy of anything. Yes, I was a sinner, but I have been saved by grace, and now I am a saint. Now I'm a son of God. Now I'm blood washed. Now I'm accepted by God. Now I'm a child of God. Now I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. And I have all the benefits of Calvary. And so God the Father looks upon those that are saved as righteous. But before salvation, none of us were righteous. Does that mean I do righteous things all the time? Far from it. But in God's estimation, because of the blood of Jesus, I have been declared justified and righteous. After establishing that all have sinned, the first half of Romans 6.23 explains the depth of this problem and its consequence. For the wages of sin is death. Jesus told Adam, the day you eat of this tree, the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil, will be the day that you die. And they disobeyed, they ate from the fruit, and they died. They didn't die physically, they were cast out of the presence of God. That's spiritual death. But Romans 6.23 doesn't stop there. This verse ends with a hope sinners have for salvation through God's Son. It goes on and it says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I earned my death, but Jesus paid for my salvation. It's a gift. You can get saved today, it's a gift. It's yours. You don't have to earn it. George Beverly Shea, I think it was, or Cliff Barrows, every time there was the altar call of Billy Graham Crusade, they sang the same hymn every time. Just as I am. Without one plea to come to me. I can't even remember all the words. But what it's saying is just as you are, just as messed up as you are, as sinful as you are, as broken as you are, come to me. Come as you are. That's what Jesus is saying. Come as you are, with all your problems, with all your sins. You that are burdened and weary, I will give you rest. The second step of the Romans road further explains the hope we have in the love of God expressed through Christ. Romans 5 and 8. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this well we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah. He didn't wait for us to get fixed up and become worthy. While we were still ungodly, while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. Romans 5, God demonstrates His own love for us. He demonstrated it. He didn't just say, oh, I love you. I love you. That's, that's an easy thing to throw around. Now. Oh, I love you. I love you. God did more than that. He demonstrated. He demonstrated his love by sending his son Jesus to die for you. Number three, once we understand our need for a Savior and recognize that Jesus Christ is a Savior, we can respond by moving along to the third part of the Romans road, calling out to Jesus. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, which means to be declared righteous, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and you are saved. Hallelujah. That's, a, that's a, an absolute. This response is possible for everyone. Romans 10, 13 expresses God's desire and ability to save everyone. His intention to save everyone is further expressed in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And Romans 10 and 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone, Jew or Gentile, 
rich or poor, sinner or just a garden wide heathen, doesn't matter who you are, if you call on Jesus, you will be saved. And even though this is not in Romans, I will read John 3, 16 and 17 to show the continuity between Jesus and Paul the Apostle. Because I've heard people say, oh, I, I know that's what Paul said, but Jesus said this. Well, Jesus and Paul were not in contradiction because the whole Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus said in 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him just means anybody. That means you're a candidate. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. We're already condemned. He didn't need to come and condemn us. We're already condemned without Jesus. We're on death row. Dead men walking all around us. Dead women walking all around us. All those that were without Jesus are dead people walking. They're, 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 they're waiting on death row. Waiting for the final sentence. And their only hope is Jesus Christ. And whosoever will may come. The fourth part of the Romans road mentions two results, peace and justification. After a sinner decides to declare and believe in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, true salvation results in peace through the blood of Jesus. And how we need peace today in our hearts. Romans 5, 1 and 2 explains that through faith in Jesus Christ, we can have peace with God. No longer separated from a holy God, but reconciled to perfect fellowship with our Heavenly Father. Once we're at enmity with God, but now through the blood of Jesus, through His sacrifice, through His death, we can have peace with God. Therefore, Romans 5, 1 and 2, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Romans 8 rejoices in the result of salvation. Before faith in Christ, we were all condemned to eternal separation from God, called spiritual death. But now, with faith in Christ, there is no condemnation. Romans 8 and 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. There's no condemnation. I'm free. We don't have to fear death. Because there's no condemnation. We don't have to fear the future. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So many people, many Christians are still condemning themselves. You're doing the devil's work. You're agreeing with the enemy. The enemy condemns. He's the accuser of the brother. <clears throat> but how do we overcome the accuser? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of testimony. Jesus said of himself, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man will come to the Father but through me. Your hope of salvation is Jesus. And the hope of the Christian today is the Jesus that saved you is the Jesus that's coming back again. He's coming back again. He's coming back for his people. He's coming back for his bride. Is your lamp full? Do you know Jesus? Does he know you? That maybe is an even more important question. Does Jesus know you? If Jesus said, there will be many that will say, I did this in your name, and I did that in your name, and I did these miracles, and, and Jesus will look at them and say, I never knew you. Depart from 
to be working today? Do you know Jesus? And do you know that Jesus knows you? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Heavenly Father. It's not a church denomination. It's not good works. It's not living the most moral life of everybody in the world. It's by putting your faith in Jesus. The one who fulfilled the law for us. The one who gave his life for us. And as you come to know the gospel of Jesus Christ for yourself, you're now going to take that gospel and share it with others. And God said, I will confirm my word. And sign it for the company. The word. As it is proclaimed. I want to invite you just to bow your heads. And yet I believe that the scriptures were read. I believe the word was proclaimed. And now I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to do his work in each one of our hearts. And ask the Holy Spirit to touch those that are here today. Do you know Jesus this morning? Do you know your sin? Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Eternal life. Abundant life means he wants to give you fullness in your life. He wants to bless you. He wants to satisfy you. He wants to give you everything that you were created to have. He wants your life to be blessed. Not just for this life, but for eternity. And I have to give this opportunity. I do it every time. Almost this invitation. Is there anyone here this morning? As we're just praying together, interceding. Is there anyone who say, when you pray for me, I, I want to give my life to Jesus today. I want to surrender to Jesus. I want to do His will. I want my life to be saved. I need Jesus in my life. Is there anyone this morning? Just put your hand up and pray for you. See one or two hands up. Anybody else? Okay, for those that put their hand up, and even if you didn't, but you mean it in your heart, would you pray this prayer, repeat it after me? Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner. But I also believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose from the dead. And I repent of my sins today. I ask you to forgive me. And be the Savior of my life. I call on you, Jesus. And ask you to deliver me from every work of the enemy. For you said in your word. That you came to destroy the works of the devil. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And fulfill your purpose for my life. I want to do your will. I want my life to bring glory to your name. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me today. Thank you for forgiving me my sins. Thank you for making me a new creation. And giving me a new heart. In Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's stand. <clears throat> We're going to lead us to the song.